there. And there's that voice again. So <laughs> uh, as many of you who are online are aware, uh, Scott Janish is with us this evening. And uh, Scott has written a fabulous book on the new IPA. Uh, and I do have, my copy is downstairs, gosh darn it. Um, but uh, it's, it's a good book. If you guys have never read it, I, I really strongly suggest you picking it up. Uh, I remember Colin Green showing it to me initially and uh, you know, showed me showed me his copy, and I was like, okay, so I, I had to get a copy myself because I wanted to go through it. It's it's really good, and Scott's here tonight, uh, uh, graciously to talk to us about making hoppy beers. So I'm gonna pass it over. I I almost sounded like Brad Smith from Beer Smith there. So I'm gonna I'll pass it I'll pass it over to you, Scott. Take it away. Well, thank you. It's funny you say uh, uh, Brad Smith. I just got done doing a, a Brad Smith podcast about a few hours ago. So it's, he must be on uh, everyone's mind, uh, apparently. Uh, but no, yeah, thank you for having me. And are you in a brewery? It, it does look like it. This is a, one of our local breweries uh, where we normally would have our, our monthly meetings on the east end of, of the city. Uh, this is a place called Muddy York, uh, and uh, uh, normally we would be there, but due to COVID, we're not, uh, but my background for Zoom. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's one of those backgrounds. All right, I was going to say, like, some people get really into uh, to home brewing, and if you just made your house look like that, that's next level stuff. Um, yeah, so I guess, you know, like you said, I... Uh, I'm Scott Janish. I am a co-founder of Sapwood Cellars, which is a brewery in Columbia, Maryland, with uh, Michael Tomsmeyer, who is probably well known to, to many of you. Um, he is uh, on vacation for a week, so he's left me with a lot to do, which is kind of him. Um, uh, but yeah, I guess, you know, I wasn't sure exactly where you guys kind of wanted me to go with this, but I was uh, just had to put together an article, uh, just kind of a somewhat broad overview of just general tips uh, for home brewers when it comes to brewing, um, you know, hazy uh, IPAs in general, but, you know, most of the focus, or at least my focus is on um, hazy IPAs. Um, and so I guess I'll just kind of walk through a, a little bit of that, that article. And then I, I would assume and hope maybe uh, answer some questions and um, go from there and feel free to uh, interrupt me if you have uh, questions on the fly or, or whatever, too, because I'm just going to basically start with grain, water, whirlpool, and just kind of uh, go through it like that, if, if that works for you guys. Um, so, again, this is kind of all mostly for uh, brewing, um, you know, hazy IPAs, where I'm thinking more of like that really like soft, chewy, approachable um, mouthfeel. And so when it comes to grain, uh, I think it's interesting that um, there's been some recent research from um, Dr. John Paul May, who is a, a works for Hopsteiner and, and does a lot of great research and is actually somewhat local to uh, DC. Um, and he's tested a bunch of uh, New England IPAs, um, commercial New England IPAs. So they, they get them sent to their lab um, and they test them for uh, certain compounds, you know, like the myrcene levels and you know, some of the, the ones that you're, are, are in high levels in hops, um, which generally don't get in your beer at very high levels. Um, but what they've actually found is that um, the hazy IPAs, you know, partly in part because of the grist is just thick and viscous and, and, and pretty soft, that these are actually retaining more hop compounds um, than, you, than you're getting in like West Coast IPAs, which is um, pretty unique to the style and interesting to to know, and that's really because you know these uh, the grists are generally pretty high in beta glucans. They're pretty high in proteins. Um, you know, for for us at the brewery, we pretty much uh, most of our IPAs and, and double IPAs have a pretty similar grain bill at this point. Um, so we we rely pretty heavily on um, chip malt. We're still big fans of of chip malt, which is like an under five under modified malt, um, great with head retention. Um, potentially even um, helping um, stability um, with the style, just based off the type of proteins. Um, it has um, it actually has a malt-derived um, thiols that might help with, with um, stability. 
Um, so we're usually about 10% chip malt when it comes to, uh, to IPA and a double IPA. Um, we're also huge fans of malted wheat. So um, there we're usually about 10% uh, of our grain bill is, is malted wheat. And I really think um, wheat is one of those that's uh, pretty, pretty important when it comes to haze. I think it's just that um, the higher protein there um, can really help. And um, being that it's malted um, might actually also help with stability, which is something we you start to care more about once you start putting beer into uh, uh, cans um, that you know make it out into the into the world. So, um, so we're about ten percent malted wheat, and then about ten percent malted oats. Um, again, it, it's malted oats for us. Just um, there's some research um, to suggest that um, there's higher levels of manganese in flaked um, grains. Um, so you know, a malted a flaked oats versus a malted oats, you'd have um, less of that um, manganese, which is a metal in um, the malted oats, which um, can lead to potentially lead to uh, more oxidation issues down the road. So um, we don't exclusively use malted, but a lot of times if we're going to be canning something, we'll, we'll switch to malted instead of flaked. Um, and then usually, you know, the rest, 70% or so is, is two row. Um, if we're doing a big double IPA and really kind of pushing it, especially like, like a triple, um, we might use uh, Pilsner malt or, or half Pilsner malt just to kind of reduce that color. For us, we're on direct fire, which I'm sure um, some of you kind of are too, just um, on the same sort of uh, setup. We have a 10 barrel system with essentially just like a big flamethrower at the bottom of the, uh, the kettle, which is, so it's basically just like a, a bigger, uh, you know, turkey, turkey fryer, which I'm sure a lot of you guys are using. Um, and we get a little more color than we want, um, would typically want just from that, that uh, direct flame. And so for us, you know, um, reducing or using some Pilsner malt, especially when there, there's just a, a lot more grain involved, which is would be in a double or triple IPA. Um, so we usually um, also we, we, we acidify our mash, which we found um, if you're doing direct fire and maybe picking up a little more color than you want, you kind of want that light straw kind of hazy look. Um, versus, you know, a little bit more of a, a slight caramel or, um, you know, a, a just it, the, the darker a hazy IPA is, the dirtier it looks. Um, and so you're trying to go as light as possible. Um, and so we usually try to get our mash pH or our uh, kettle pH to around um, four, nine or so. Um, and we're just adding um, lactic acid to, to the kettle to get that. And that just helps with a little um, less color pickup. Um, so honestly, that's pretty much our, our basic, uh, um, grist, um, when it comes to, uh, hazy IPAs, um, moving to water, we're pretty, uh, you know, pretty, I wouldn't say lax, but we just, we're, we have pretty neutral water. Um, so we're just running it through a big carbon filter. Um, and then we're just doing, um, you know, calcium chloride and gypsum, um, where it's of course, you know, favoring chloride, which is, I'm sure a lot of you guys already, already know. Um, we're generally shooting for a, a mash pH of around five, one, five, three. I like to go pretty low on these, especially if, if the beer is going to be heavily, heavily dry hop later that can rise your, or raise your pH. So we try to give it a, a little a bit of a head start by starting on that lower end. Um, uh, you know, I'm trying to think if there's anything else really. I mean, we, we're usually about 150, uh, 175 parts per million uh, chloride to about 75 or so gypsum. Um, really one of the, there, there's a, I, I hope it would get studied again, but there's a, a test that, I, or a, a paper that I point to in the book that looks at, you know, how different gypsum levels can impact um, hop character, uh, you know, hop flavor. Um, and they found as that uh, gypsum levels go up, um, the tasting panel perceived less um, of like just true hop flavor. Um, and I would theorize that that's really just because, you know, the higher the gypsum level, kind of the, the drier the sensory impact that you can get, at least in my opinion, from, um, from beer. So, you know, the drier the beer that kind of like cuts off that, that taste um, as you're swallowing, it kind of just doesn't let it kind of carry through, it makes it a um, little less... Um, you know, lasting. So um, one of the main reasons is that we use chloride is, is that, and, and also just the, the roundness that it brings a little more smoothness um, to beer. Um, 
Well, we do quite a bit of at the brewery and almost every single beer um, is mash hopping. Um, so we're adding, you know, for us, um, it's, we're, we're doing you know, 10 barrels at a time. Um, and so we're usually throwing in about two to four pounds of, of mash hops in um, with every beer. Um, this really just stemmed from um, some research that um, was um, pretty convincing to me that by adding, um, you know, alpha acids and beta acids to your mash, um, what they can do is complex some um, metals like copper that can, again, cause oxidation issues down the road. Um, and in the specific paper, when they added mash hops to beer, they saw a reduction um, in those alpha or in those uh, metals that you know are naturally in the grain. Um, so, and I think they're thrown in a mash. Um, they eat you know early in the in the kettle. They added some, and um, it was clear that just it's just that that getting those alpha and beta acids in early on can can really help uh, lower that, which you know could potentially help. Um, with shelf life down the road. Um, it, it was interesting in that, that study that they found the lower, or I'm sorry, the higher the pH, the better those, um, the alpha acids were at complexing those problematic metals. Um, so that suggests that if you're gonna uh, mash up, maybe you know, just a couple ounces in a five gallon batch, um, throwing those in before you uh, um, make adjustments for your mash pH, um, that can just you know give it a little bit of a, a head start, maybe a little better uh, chance at, at complexing those metals, which is the whole point of um, of doing that. Um, this is a, a little off topic, kind of, but um, there's now uh, some research from Omega uh, Yeast, um, and um, with I won't get completely into genetically engineered strains, uh, uh, just because that's such a, a complex topic, but. Um, they do have some new strains um, like uh, Cosmic Punch from Omega, and um, there's a yeast lab in Berkeley, and theirs is called Tropics. And these are genetically engineered strains um, that are designed to have um, genes inserted um, that are, are known to be bioconverting genes. That so and, uh, they're responsible for creating uh, the necessary enzymes to to free up um, additional um, thiols from hops. Um, and just to kind of tie that back to mash hopping, what they actually found is, you know, dry hopping with hops that are really high in, in bound files like saws or Calypso or, um, you know, even, I, Cascade is even on that list. Um, mash hopping, at, you know, close to one to two pounds per barrel. Um, if you're going to experiment with some of these uh, genetically engineered strains might be a great way to uh, free up some additional um, some additional uh, thiols, particularly 3MH from, from hops, which is a, you know, a grapefruit leaning um, compound. So that's kind of an off, off, off topic, but interesting when it comes to mash hopping that um, as we start to understand more about um, enzymes, particularly the enzyme beta lyase um, and how important it might be to get hops in as early as possible. It's something about the mash, um, all that, the enzyme activity that's already happening in the mash um, is allowing those bound compounds to but, but more easily be accessed by yeast that can then um, you know, transfer or you know, release them from their, their bound state to the free state. Um, so let's move on to uh, whirlpool hops. We don't do a whole lot of kettle hopping um, at the brewery and that's more of, uh, we do like whirlpool hopping, but we're not adding you know bittering charges early on. And that's mainly just because we, wouldn't have a way to cool our uh, whirlpool down um, to temperatures before we add our hops, just because it would clog our, our heat exchanger, which is um, probably something some of you uh, have experienced too. But we will sometimes use some um, hop extracts like incognito um, in the in the kettle just to uh, avoid that if we want a little more bitterness. Um, we're generally around two pounds per barrel of hops uh, in the whirlpool. And this is um, at around 180 degrees. Um, and so I think that would, you know, I have to do the math, but a homebrew batch, that's probably, um, you know, six to, to eight, six to nine um, ounces of hops in the whirlpool. Um, we do a you know, 20 minute uh, rest and then just kind of, you know, start, start chilling. Um, it, that's not a, crazy high um, whirlpool amount, but it is higher than a lot of other breweries go. 
Um, I've really found that to get a balanced um, IPA, especially a, you know, a hazy IPA, if you don't use enough hops in the kettle, it, it, there's not enough of that hop saturated flavor that can kind of carry that heavy, heavy dry hopping load. So when we do, you know, I personally have done some beers um, as a home brewer that I, I even sent in to get testing uh, of hop compounds. And if I did zero um, hops in the kettle, so no bittering, no whirlpool at all, and just dry hopping, and I think I did like 10 ounces of dry hops and five gallons, it was really, um, really vegetal. Um, there wasn't that hop saturated, just hot side flavor that I think um, you need in a, in a hoppy beer to just carry or just to have some balance. Um, I, I wish I knew exactly why that is, but there's something about getting those in um, at the start of, of fermentation from those from the heat. Um, the heat can actually cleave some some compounds, too, and, and free some more for the um, for your yeast to to act on. Um, but so we get, you know, generally, you know, our double IPAs in theory, the IBUs are, are somewhat closer to like 100 um, IPAs are usually around 70. And that's, you know, using uh, beer smith to um, get an estimate on that. But um, IBUs can be a, a little misleading just because, um, you know, it, the IBU test just looks at um, individual hop comp or individual hop uh, bittering acids. Um, but they looks at all of them as a whole. So it doesn't distinguish which different hop bittering acids are in there. Um, and that's kind of important because when you, when you dry hop, um, you're adding um, a hop bittering acid, like it's called uh, humulones. And humulones are about 66% as bitter as um, isomerized alpha acids. And so you know, what that means is when, when you dry hop, you're actually the like, vegetal materials pulling out some of your hot side isomerized alpha acids, replacing them with um, very polar, meaning they get into your beer very easily, uh, humulones. Um, and so you're, you're, you're kind of having a trade-off there, but um, the IBU test might read 100, but because some of those bittering acids are actually uh, sensory impact is, is lower, your, your actual bitterness um, level would be quite a bit lower than 100. So um, I kind of say that as, as a way to, I, I think IBU test is a great way to um, make brewing the same beer over and over again um, easier, um, but it's probably not a, a true uh, like sensory bitterness number. Um, when it comes to like which hops to put into the Whirlpool, this is something um, we've had a lot of fun with at, at Sapwood because we're just, you know, constantly just buying new uh, new varieties and trying them um, in the whirlpool, and then trying to take um, really good notes before, you know, after primary fermentation is done. Before we dry hop, we like tasting them at that point. Um, that's where you can really tell, you know, how the how well your hot side hopping did. Can you smell it? Can you taste it? Um, does it taste like a little bit more bitter than you thought? You know, did you change the temperature of the whirlpool? Um, it's just a great, I think it's one of the most important times to taste the beer if you're, if you're focusing on hot side hopping is that right before you, you slap it with a whole bunch of um, dry hops. But um, in terms of which hops um, to use, um, I really like uh, Yakima Chief's uh, work recently on what they call survivable hop compounds. Um, so what they really did is they took beer, um, hoppy beer in a glass and dissected that to say, okay, which, which hop compounds are in the finished beer and then work backwards. Um, so they go, okay, there's a bunch of linalools surviving. Um, you know, some hop esters like 2-MIB are surviving. Um, some hop thiols like 4-MMP and 3-MH might be surviving. Um, so there's a, a class of these compounds that they know are making their way through the whole process. They're surviving some of the kettle, they're surviving trub, they're surviving um, yeast, they're su surviving, um, you know, CO2 scrubbing from active fermentation. And so they looked at uh, all these compounds as a whole and then looked at, okay, now which hops have the highest amount of those individual compounds that they know are surviving. Um, and it's, it's kind of fascinating because um, Mike and I have always thought that Idaho 7, for whatever reason, um, was just super good at, at um, giving us good hop saturated flavor from the from the whirlpool. Um, we had no idea really why, but it just um, it became to the point where we had to start backing down our, our Idaho Seven um, 
concentrations in, in our whirlpool just so it wouldn't be not too dominant that it would um, outshine dry hopping, but it might clash a little bit depending on which dry hops we use. Um, but Yakima Chief's research found that, um, you know, Idaho, Idaho 7 in particular is one of the highest um, um, hops in terms of having um, these survivable group of survivable compounds. So um, that was something that um, we thought was kind of neat to, to see some science that was kind of backing up um, our experience, but we didn't, you know, particularly know why. Um, some of the other um, ones that they have high on the list, uh, um, so these would be good ones to use uh, in your whirlpool is, you know, Idaho 7, like we mentioned, Mosaic, Bravo, Centennial, uh, Mount Hood, Eureka, mm -hmm. Simcoe, Millennium, um, and Pato. Pato is one that I don't know if a lot of people have, have used, but um, in, in Yakima Chief's test, they, they looked at a, you know, most of the, the hops that they um, they have in their um, you know at their at their place and they saw that Pato was tested at one of the highest levels of 3MH which is um, like like a grapefruit leaning thiol but it was like head and shoulders above the other hops it was pretty incredibly high and I'm not certain if they were testing bound or, or free um, 3MH um, there's two different ones there's a it's called like a it's kind of nerdy but it's like a cis um, 3MH um, precursor, or there's a free um, 3MH. But what what the, I found so interesting about seeing that Pato was so high in that was because um, you know 3MH was one compound that they found actually um, increased during a boil. So you know if you were um, this might be because you know grain actually has some 3MH precursors. Um, and maybe uh, the heat itself from the boil is liberating some of those uh, precursors as well. But to me, that's interesting because Pato might be, you know, if you're throwing in a 60-minute charge or a 30-minute charge or um, maybe even mash hopping with something like um, Pato, um, just to try to get a super high 3MH um, thial hop in, potentially to have it, you know, even increase even more during the boil. Um, just to, to hopefully have an impact in the, on the final beer, just because 3MH in particular, it can be a, a difficult one to get um, in your beer at its um, sensory um, numbers uh, if you're not using like a genetically engineered strain. Um, uh, whirlpool temperatures, I think I mentioned, I usually go about 180 degrees. Um, we pretty much do that across the board on most of our beers. Um, we have kind of a unique setup in that. So we have a 10 barrel system, but we're oftentimes filling 20 barrel tanks. So what that means is we'll be um, brewing twice in one day. Um, and so what we'll do sometimes is um, we'll chill the whirlpool on one of those batches and we won't ch chill the other. Um, and we kind of you know, use those lower alpha hops in the um, non-chilled batch, but that's kind of more of a practicality on our end. But um, we probably would be chilling uh, more often if it was a single batch. And um, there, there's one study that I, I point to uh, in the book and, and like to cite. Um, and I hope this is something they, they test again with, with more varieties. But um, they used, uh, they did Whirlpool uh, hop additions at like 100, 203, uh, 185 degrees and 167, 170 degrees. Um, just to see which, which temperature, how the temperature had an impact on the whirlpool in terms of you know, how, many, how many compounds were making their way uh, into the beer at those different temperatures. And it was that mid-range mid one at about 185 degrees that retained um, you know, slightly more of these monoterpene alcohols that I think are great um, complexity builders when it comes to um, just overall hop flavor. Um, so they had more of those at 180 um, 185 degrees, um, then at 203, and then 167. So the, the lowest temperature one they tested, um, they actually saw a little bit uh, less than the 185, and then that also got a little more um, herbal on them. So 185 was had the highest uh, like fruity. Um, the the panel saw it was like the the fruitiest, and they also um, measured the beer and, and saw that it had, you know, some of the highest amount of the uh, monoterpene alcohols, which is kind of what you're after when you're, when you're doing those whirlpool additions. Um, yeast selection, that's another topic that you could go on and on about. Um, 
for most of our beers, we're doing a, you know, a London ale three. Um, we really like uh, a elite yeast lab in um, Richmond, Virginia that, um, you know, theirs is called Manchester United I'm, I'm, or Manchester uh, ale yeast, not Manchester United. Um, but they, uh, they um, pretty much it's a lot of these com yeast companies have like their same kind of London ale three strain. I'm sure you guys know all about them. The you know, 1318, um, there's like the foggy London ale yeast, uh, Omega British ale, um, Imperial juice. Um, Lollamon now has a uh, verdant IPA uh, yeast, which is a dry yeast that we've actually used on a few um, batches as a, a dry strain that um, performed pretty well. So if you're ever in a pinch, I think that's a, a good one. Um, the Conan strains are, are still fun. We use those quite a bit. We're actually going to use the Conan strain in an upcoming stout um, as kind of a, a prep, a prop batch for uh, some IPAs and double IPAs. We've um, heard good things. One of our friends uh, also, um, he's a head brewer at a, a local brewery and, and also someone that came up with Mike and I and uh, the DC Home Brewers Club is a, a big fan of Conan in, uh, in dark beers. Um, but that's uh, Omega's uh, 052 um, Giga Yeast has a Vermont IPA, uh, the Burlington Ale, um, RDA, who we really like from the Manchester, has a like Hop Stopper Ale. Um, so all those are kind of you know, the same strain, but just uh, you know different uh, yeast labs um, producing them. Um, and again, the if if you're interested in trying the um, genetically engineered strains. Um, I, I really like uh, the Cosmic Punch strain, which is uh, just came out pretty recently. Um, as it comes to, as it relates, so they, they, this one's engineered specifically to increase your chances of biotransformation. Um, this is something I've been after for, for a long time, trying to use research from the wine world um, to really you know, pick wine strains that um, they are great at freeing on thiols and, and um, glycosides, you know, like mono, more monoterpene alcohols. So a lot of like the wine grapes have the same thiols um, as hops and um, the wine world has been uh, much more uh, ahead of the beer world when it comes to biotransformation. Um, and essentially, so I was been trying for years to try to co-pitch different wine strains um, that are known to be high bioconverters um, without a whole bunch of uh, success. I made some interesting beers, but nothing that we really wanted to scale up or um, do anything like that at the brewery. Um, and that's why I was so excited about the, this engineered strain because they're, they're um, in terms of the cosmic punch strain, they actually took the gene from uh, Chico yeast. Um, and that gene is responsible for creating the enzyme that's freeing all these um, bound hop thiols. Um, which is amazing that um, Chico, which uh, it has this gene the whole time, it's just not like it's not turned on essentially. Um, it's 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 not um, having to be used. So they they took it from Chico, inserted it into a London Ale three strain, and then turned it up. Um, so they elevated it to um, increase even more of the the um, enzyme activity that that's freeing these compounds. Um, and it's, it's pretty remarkable that um, in, in some of their lab tests, they're getting higher 3MH um, thiol counts from beers with Cosmic Punch um, fermented without hops at all. So, so just the precursors in grain alone and this yeast strain is getting your 3MH levels, which is a, a super um, low sensory or low threshold thiol. Um, they're getting higher amounts without even using hops um, with this strain, which is <laughs> pretty crazy. Um, but I realize engineered strains uh, aren't, aren't for everyone, but I, I, I do think it's fun um, to experiment with. Um, what's next? So uh, I guess dry hopping is, is the next, uh, next thing to kind of uh, briefly cover. Um, we, we dry hop uh, relatively high. So we're, we're usually around four pounds, um, three to four pounds, sometimes five. We just did a five pounds per barrel, uh, triple IPA. Generally, our general rule is kind of the higher the ABV, the more hops you can um, really throw at, at a beer, um, which is a little ironic in that the lower alcohol beers are harder to actually get extracted flavor into just because alcohol itself is 
um, kind of a acts as an extractant. So, um, but yeah, we're generally around that um, three to, to five uh, pounds per barrel, which is you know around eight to 10 ounces or so um, on a homebrew scale. Um, we, uh, I'm a big fan, and this is again, based off a lot of research um, that kind of led us in this direction, but to dry hop at, at cooler temperatures and for uh, short duration. So um, we dry hop pretty much all of our beers below 58 degrees, um, 56 usually, 54. We're doing that for about two, um, three days tops. Um, we're agitating our hops um, about once a day, which means, you know, we're just, when, I think this is especially true for um, homebrew batches, when you add hops um, to your fermenter and it's a small vessel, it just doesn't take much time for those hops to want to drop um, and kind of go to the bottom where, you know, they're not you know, really doing much for you if they're packed on the bottom of your vessel. Giant fermenters, like 100, 200 barrel fermenters, I think you add them to the top if that's how you're doing it, it just takes a lot longer for them to get down, which I think they're kind of extracting while they're doing that. Um, so agitation for us is, seems to uh, really help. It's, um, for us, it's just blasting uh, CO2 in the bottom of our, our, our tanks about you know, 30, 40 seconds at about 30 uh, PSI, um, just, just opening the valve and letting it go. Um, when I do small test batches uh, at the brewery, we, Mike and I, We'll have all of our home beer gear and, and we, you know, a lot of times we'll steal work from tanks and do separate dry hops in, in our five gallon kegs just to, you know, try new hop varieties or, um, you know, experiment with different comp hop combinations. Um, but what we'll do is we'll just put the, you know, the beer's done fermenting at that point and we'll make sure there's, you know, 10 to 15 PSI of head pressure on. Um, and once or twice a day, kind of just pick up that keg, shake it. Um, just to try to encourage those hops to get back into a uh, suspension where they can uh, extract. Um, so again, short, short duration, um, cooler temperatures. Um, there's some research uh, that I, I cite in a, a blog post on cool uh, dry hopping um, that, you know, found that the, you know, polyphenols are something that are you know, not necessarily a, a bad thing in hops. Um, it's part of the reason, you know, hazy IPAs are hazy as they, you know, link with, uh, proteins but um, in high amounts um, polyphenols can get really astringent um, the, the finish on a beer with a lot of high polyphenols can be just a little harsh it's not very inviting to want to have another sip um, and this particular paper found that you know dry hopping warm so like above your um, fermentation temperature so you know say you ferment at 68 and you go up to 73 or four, just to like, you know, let that ferment finish out healthy. Um, if you're dry hopping and that warmer temperature, you're getting two to two and a half times more polyphenols potentially than you would be um, at lower temperatures, like in the fifties. Um, and for us, that's important because we're, you know, when you, of course, the more you're, you're dry hopping, the more polyphenols you could get. And I think that's one of my biggest complaints um, with, hazy IPAs in general. I, I love hazy IPAs, but sometimes they can be a little bit um, too uh, like chalky, too astringent, too green, vegetal-like, um, where it's just, you can't even really tell which hop varieties were in it. It just kind of tastes uh, green. Um, and so that's also, um, myrcene of course is um, one of the highest um, compounds in oil or in hops versus, you know, in, when you look at like their total oil. Um, generally don't extract very well into beer. I think, um, you know, there's one paper from Thomas Shellhammer that's, that, that found that, um, you know, myrcene in one particular test, you know, despite representing most of the, the hop oil, um, only less than 1% of that um, myrcene actually extracted in the beer. Um, but I, I think um, it's important to know, like, the warmer you dry hop, the more uh, myrcene you can get. Um, and so um, it's kind of that combination to me of those higher polyphenols, higher myrcene, higher, you know, the higher hydrocarbon um, that you get into a beer that the more it's um, a little less, um, it, it takes away from that like bright, fresh citrus fruit thing and kind of just leans more herbal, vegetal, 
um, and woody sometimes even. Um, it's, it's like a, it's like a black tea kind of a, a taste, I think, if it's in too high of a amounts. Um, and so shorter duration again, um, um, cooler temperatures can kind of reduce um, the amount of those compounds that could, um, especially when dry hopping in high amounts, kind of lead to some of those flavors. Um, manganese again, um, the warmer you dry hop, um, the more manganese you can get, which um, is just a, another um, shelf stability kind of issue for, for us. Um, and, and I guess most importantly, you're still getting um, good ex you know, extraction of your dry hops at cooler temperatures. So you can kind of, you know, let fermentation finish, um, start your soft crash tusk that's like 58 degrees, which is enough to get our yeast to drop out. Um, we'll remove those from the cone and then start dry hopping. Um, you can kind of shave a few days um, on that because you're already, in, you know, in that cool state. Um, let's see what else. Um, hop creep is in a huge concern probably with, with a lot of home brewers. Um, it, it wasn't something I was too concerned with um, when I was home brewing, but that's just because I was dry hopping everything. And then, you know, as soon as, you know, within two weeks, I was in a keg and I was cold. Um, you know, and it's just not a lot of uh, enzyme activity at that um, when you're treating your beer like that. But um, hop creep, for those who don't know, is essentially um, there's enzymes in hops that um, are capable of freeing up um, dextrins. So freeing up um, sugars from your beer that are otherwise unfermentable makes them fermentable. Um, and depending on how much yeast is still in the beer, it can start re-fermenting, which can lead to um, higher carbonation levels if it's packaged. Um, that referment can start when there's not a lot of um, healthy yeast in there, which can lead to um, poor refermentation, which can um, lead to like diacetyl type flavors. Um, and so one of the ways to uh, avoid um, hop creep is to um, dry hop at, at cooler temperatures. Again, those, those enzymes um, aren't as active uh, at colder temperatures. So that's another reason we're, we're about, are below you know, 58, 56 degrees when we're, when we're dry hopping. Um, the other way I, I, I will say that there's, and there's um, breweries that do this, they deal with hop creep by just doing the complete opposite. So they dry hop um, warm after primary fermentation, you know, 70 degrees, they give it a week and they just let any sort of hop creep that's gonna happen to happen and then they um, crash. So um, there's no perfect way to do any of this. Um, there's, there's multiple, many ways you can achieve um, certain things, but um, we like to kind of look um, at the science or in the research as more of a guide um, to experimenting. Um, it's never a hard or fast rule, but um, it does kind of give us uh, somewhere, somewhere to look, or at least a, a starting point when it comes to uh, trying to change things. Um, I think one of the last things is just, um, you know, I've oxygen is like one of the things I think it can have the biggest detrimental impact um, on on home brewed beers. Um, if if I one of my rules when I was um, uh, home brewing when it when it came to like buying more, yeah, you know, buying more stuff for the for the home brew setup was is it going to save me more time? Like I will spend. Um, an extra $200 on a device if it's going to shave 40 minutes off every brew day. Um, not that I don't like brewing, but it's just, it's already a hobby that takes up a lot of, of, of time. Um, but, you know, the other, the other rule to me that I will also pay more, more money if it just makes a better beer. Um, and to me, that is um, um, spending money on, on the cold side. And so, you know, spending money on fermenters, um, on any sort of way that you can um, avoid oxygen pickup post fermentation. You know, so this is you know having a, a fermenter that you can put uh, pressure on. I think is huge, so you can transfer in and out of that um, with ever having to open anything up. It's more just putting pressure on the top uh, and pushing out at you know five ten psi. Um, Spending money on maybe dry hopping in kegs where you can put um, the, or the hops loose into a keg. I used to put a dip tube, uh, a filter around my dip tube and just throw the hops in loose, um, close it, um, purge it. So I would um, 
put uh, the ball lock, I would put the gas actually on the dip tube side just loosely and then open the vent. So the CO2 is going in at like 10, 15 PSI through the gap or through the pickup tube. So it's actually going in through the bottom of the keg and then coming out. So you're kind of flushing the keg with CO2. Um, do that for three or four minutes um, and then close it up, switch it to the, uh, the gas side where it's supposed to be. Um, I never put it on all the way. I'm sure you guys have done that before. We can't get, can't get those things off if you have them um, swapped, but um, I would then take it off the, the liquid side and put it on the gas side. And then I um, bring it up to like 15 PSI, um, blow it all the way down to zero, bring it back up to 15 PSI. And I do that about four or five times. And then I transfer um, in a closed way um, into the keg that's um, got the hops loose. The hops themselves are purged. The keg is purged. Um, you can take it a step further even. And when you're, um, instead of just pulling the um, pop it on your keg to get the uh, CO2 out, um, whatever line you're going to use to transfer with, if you have a way to release the pressure in the keg through that line, you're then purging that line too, as well as your keg, um, which is a, another way to kind of reduce, um, you know, oxygen pickup. Um, unfortunately, it's just, you know, you have five or 10 gallons of beer, it just doesn't take as you know, much oxygen to have a, an impact, especially with you know, hazy IPAs, which um, can go downhill pretty quickly. Um, so because of that, I think um, those kind of things can go a long ways towards um, you know, just maintaining that bright, fresh, hoppy character that you're after. Uh, I always say you can do absolutely everything right. You can have, use the best hops um, at the best times. Um, your grist is perfect. Um, you know, you're dry hopping as, you know, in ways that you, you know, are taking advantage of, of certain varieties, um, using them, you know, mid fermentation, if you're trying to reduce certain compounds or post, you can do absolutely everything right, but then just a little oxygen can, um, really take a, take a beer downhill. So, um, I would even consider adding a little bit of metabisulfite to, uh, hoppy beers, like 0.2 grams or so per, uh, five gallons. Um, again, that's just a way to, to help um, keep those uh, dissolved oxygen levels, the DO levels down. Um, so I hate to, you know, just oxygen, 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 but that's just one of those things that um, uh, is kind of the enemy of, of hoppy beers. A um, couple other things is, you know, I, I'm a big fan of trying to dry hop loose, you know, not trying to pack a whole bunch of dry hops into a container where they don't have room to like, to really swell, um, to really be in the most contact with the beer. Um, you know, there's you know, some research that, that suggests you get a little better extraction too when you're um, you know, not confining hops to a bag or you know, a, one of those stainless steel um, spheres that you can, um, you know, I think you usually screw on the, the cap. Um, I've done, I've done some beers, right. I throw a bunch of hops in those things, close the cap. Um, when it comes time to cleaning the keg, I open that cap up and there's still whole pellets in there because they're just too overpacked. Um, and that's a, you know, you're clearly not getting extraction if you, you can still see the pellet form. Um, but there's a, you know, there's so many, uh, variables in, when it comes to brewing and sometimes it's a little overwhelming to, to really try to uh, dial it all in. But um, I think the, the main thing is for me when I was, uh, and even now it's just still trying to brew things I enjoy and um, you know, trying to, to, to do everything I can that um, to obviously make the beer better. But also um, for me, it's just, I have a weird uh, obsession with reading um, new uh, academic papers and new studies. And um, you know, it gets me excited to try new things or you know, try, certain hops at certain points or, um, you know, Mike and I will, will, will tweak our, our process sometimes just because of, of new research. Um, for example, uh, Omega Yeast uh, just did some research um, that, you know, kind of proved one of the things, one of my uh, theories wrong from my book actually, which is, which is interesting. Um, they found that um, when dry hopping, um, during fermentation. So a lot of times people think, you know, uh, drying, dry hopping during active fermentation is considered like a biotransformation hop addition. Um, I don't know how particularly true that is just because 
you need the right enzymes. And a lot of times that's not even in uh, normal yeast strains. Um, there's a few ways, there's like the geraniol to beta citronella sort of biotransformation, um, the thing that happens with ale strains, but that's kind of about it. Um, mostly I think if you're dry hopping during active fermentation, you're scrubbing, you're, you're changing the, the classes of compounds that are making it into, the, that have the chance to make it into the beer. So by dry hopping during active fermentation, um, you know, you're, those more volatile uh, hydrocarbons are probably gonna leave. Um, they're going to be pushed out pretty easily. Um, you can kind of alter or, or tame down some beers that way. I think, you know, Sabro is one of those hops for me that is very, very uh, unique and fun, but can kind of dominate a little bit. So that might be a good one to use uh, mid fermentation where some of those um, woodier compounds can um, be uh, um, volatized and, and sort of, you know, back down a little bit. But um, Omega found that, you know, it, when you're dry hopping during fermentation, you know, if you, if you were to dry hop on day one of fermentation, you can actually get a, a clearer beer than you would if you dry hop towards the tail end of fermentation or not dry hop at all, um, which is interesting. And so, you know, if, if, if haze is something you're really after, you probably do um, want to avoid, you know, dry hopping um, on, on day one or day two and waiting towards that tail end where it seems to really kind of lock in that um, hop oil induced haze. So, um, that's just, a, a, a another, I guess that's an example of where I was a, a little bit wrong when I theorized something in the book, I, I thought, um, you know, if you're dry hopping during active ferment or day one of fermentation, you have more proteins present than you do on the tail end. Um, and you, uh, um, adding a whole bunch of polyphenols, I figured they would link up and, and really, um, really make a beer super hazy, but I guess that is not the case, but, um, so anyways, that's a whole bunch of talking, um, on a, a bunch of, uh, different, different areas. And so, um, you know, I'm sorry, I didn't have any sort of prepared, uh, presentation, uh, visually for you, but, um, I'm happy to try to answer some questions if, if anyone has any. I think that, I think that was awesome. Um, you touched on a lot of, of current stuff too, Scott. I think the, uh, the topic of the survivables, which has been all over the place lately. Um, it's, it's re that was really interesting. And um, I think that's, uh, I think that might change the way things go uh, for the craft breweries, uh, but also for the home brewers as well. Uh, I'll throw it open though. I mean, does anybody have any questions for, uh, for Mr. Janish here? I'm sure somebody does. Come on. I, I do actually. I always do. But... I always do if I can jump in. Sure, Rain, go ahead. Um, I mean, I, I love what you're, uh, I mean, absolutely a lot of, the, um, well, first, okay, first of all, long time reader, first time caller. A lot of your blog has actually assisted me in improving my beer. Uh, it's for some of the goals we talked about here, mostly on flavor. And I think I'm getting there. Um, on a home brewer scale with a, a very crude, I mean, I think there are probably meth labs in the third world that are more sophisticated in my brew setup. Um, I'm struggling with how to really get to hop aroma and maintain it. And, you know, and I know that survivability stuff we talked about is probably part of the key to it. But any thoughts you have on, um, you know, I'm getting beautiful flavor and it just doesn't come out on the nose. Um, is this, uh, do you, what kind of dry hopping rates do you typically do? Uh, I, well, I don't typically anything because I've been experimenting like hell, but um, I've, you know, I've done exactly what you talked about. I tried earlier and I don't typically dry hop in, for, in primary. Okay. So I tend to go early secondary, uh, secondary during crash, uh, which is where I've had the best results actually, you yeah. know, um, uh, moving something from about 18 degrees Celsius to working it down to six in the fridge. And I, hop it on the way in maybe okay. i'm not using enough hops but i do, i've found that over hopping does get vegetal at that point yeah but yeah. i am getting the best flavors doing it that way but i just don't seem to get good aroma that aroma yeah yeah unfortunately you know that's it is one of the hardest things to get and even um uh, even today uh, on, on a batch that we were dry hopping with um you know galaxy and and um nelson i was not thrilled with our aroma so i um 
you know, gave it a whole nother round of agitation that wasn't really planned just to try to get a little, you know, pull a little bit more out of it. Um, I, I found just, just speaking a, um, a homebrew experience that once I started to dry hop under pressure, I started to get a little bit more, uh, retain some more aroma. So that just means once the, the hops are in, I was you know, about 10 or 15 PSI on that, on that head pressure. Um, kind of the idea is you're, you're pushing, you want more, um, CO2 pressure on the beer that on the top of the beer, than the beer has in solution. Um, and that's essentially, you're trying to keep what's in there in there. And cause you don't want anything to go into that head space. Um, and so if you, if you are dry hopping, uh, you know, dry hopping itself, if there's no firm or head pressure at all, it's going to be agitated and it's going to want to start pushing some of those volatiles into the head space. Um, and that's where, you know, keeping that head pressure on, um, can be helpful. And then again, you know, agitating it or picking it up and kind of moving it around can work. Um, sometimes, unfortunately, it's just how good of quality your hops are, um, when it comes to, um, aroma, which can be the frustrating part sometimes. Well, um, we only buy the best hops to the club, so we don't have a problem with that, but. Oh, good. There you go. But your pressure idea is something I've, I've only recently decided, I've started to go to, uh, I've never fermented under pressure, but I've secondary and pressure now. Yeah. And, and, uh, probably the next batch or two might unlock what you're talking about. So, yeah, I think that's, that's worth a try, it, especially once you're, um, once fermentation is over, putting pressure on it is, uh, is a good thing to try. And, um, and if you're still kind of desperate and still not getting to where you want to be, um, I, I, I've been experimenting more with some of these post fermentation, uh, hop oils. Um, so you can now buy from Hop Steiner. Um, there's a company called Glacier, um, hops ranch that has like this hop zoil brand um one of the ones i'm a little more familiar with just because i i like kind of their uh, their proprietary approach to it is totally natural solutions makes um some hop um, variety specific oils so that means they're taking um like they're making oil from citra hops to make a citra oil um and this is you know already emulsified um, already pretty much ex like extracted into a vial and you can kind of add that. Um, it's not going to replace hops or completely change, you know, how, how you approach things. There's something that you, you can't get from oils that you get from hops, but um, it is a way to just add a little bit more of a top note, a little bit more um, something interesting to a, a, a beer that, um, you, you know, an oil that is um, in some, unfortunately, it's usually like a ethanol solution or yeah, sometimes the, even the like, extract medium is often a concern. Let's we'll say that again. The extract mediums are often a concern. The uh, the carriers, the, the yeah, glycol. how they get them, yeah, yeah. Um, you can buy some of these that aren't um, emulsified yet, which means you just have to add them to like a uh, alcohol solution, like Everclear or something, and then add those in, but, um, just something else to maybe consider uh, buying of some, some small vials. Cause this is something you can do, uh, post fermentation in a glass, you know, just for your own, um, your own experimentation without having to ruin a whole batch or anything, you know, just kind of dropping it into a, a full pint and, um, stirring it up a little bit and tasting it. And then if you like it, you could, you know, consider shooting it into, uh, the, your keg from another keg or, um, you know, just do it using that, uh, the next time you go around, but, um, just something else to another tool in the, in the toolkit, if, if anyone's ever interested in, in looking into those. Awesome. Thanks for the ideas. Thanks for the question, Rain. And, and thank you, uh, Scott, for, for that answer. Yeah. Uh, next up, I think, uh, uh, even though it says Dana, it's not Dana. It's actually Daryl and Colin out in Pickering. Uh, they have a question, uh, I think, for you there, Scott. So guys, go ahead. My question pertains to like uh, water chemistry, you were saying. Um, with regards to like your chloride and sulfate, like a lot of times when like we add like all of our water additions, like we're adding it in conjunction with calcium. Are you thinking about like, say with like um, your chlorides, like, are you adding like maybe like an Epsom instead of like, like calcium chloride all the time to like maybe limit your calcium content in your beer? Cause I've heard that like large calcium content in the beer can lead to like negative effects on like haze stability and like different things. Uh, 
Um, you know, it's, uh, I'm not sure exactly, you know, I am, I don't know uh, if I've seen any um, academic papers um, on calcium as it relates to um, some of that. Um, we do though, occasionally use um, Epsom salt um, and we'll do this um, right before we add um, our whirlpool hops. Um, there's, you um, there's, there's a flavor to it that it's hard to explain, but, um, you know, there, there's some, are, some um, big breweries that to me anyways, have this like Epsom salt, like, um, flavor addition. And so, um, I know like in the, if, if anyone that are, are big coffee people, um, a lot of times there's, um, Epsom salt or magnesium added to, um, coffee in order to coax out some of these fruitier flavors, um, from the beans and, um, it's never been studied uh, with hops, but I, I, can, I couldn't, I always wonder if that might be happening um, with, when, so that's kind of why we add them um, sometimes in our IPAs uh, in the whirlpool right before our hops go in. But um, for us, if we do add that, it's, it's not really with the concern with calcium. It's just more of a, a different sort of flavor and finish that you can get with um, Epsom salt. Um, but again, a lucky thing there is that you can always try that in, in a glass and, and see if you, you know, like how it, how it tastes. Um, but yeah, I, I would, I'd be curious to, uh, um, do some more diving into, uh, calcium, like you were saying, but. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Daryl. Uh, Colin, you didn't have a question. I, for some for some reason or other, I expected Colin to ask a question, but I guess not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so. not not yet. I'll let someone else go first. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right, all right. Uh, Marcelo, you're up next, and then Joss, you you're, you're next in line there. Hi, Scott. Thank you so much for the book and all the information you provide to all of us. It is just uh, amazing. Uh, sometimes I, I read it, your stuff, and I go, "No way!" Can I try it? <laughs> And it definitely has improved my IPAs from nothing to uh, very uh, uh, interesting uh, beers. Uh, my question is, uh, after I fermented and I'm transferring, uh, so let's just say I do fermentation under pressure and I have my serving keg under pressure. I've heard that uh, dumping a uh, Kempton tablet in there and then transferring the beer would slow down oxidation. What do, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's uh, kind of where I, I, I um, briefly talked about using uh, uh, metabisulfate into a, a keg. It's a, you know the same kind of, of thought. Um, I, I do think it can have a, a positive impact. And I, I think if you use it on smaller, um, you know, on the smaller, dosage it's not going to have a flavor impact as well um if any of you guys are fans of uh, marshall's um, blog the brewlosophy um brewlosophy stuff that's out there they've they've done a few of these uh where they dose um metabisulfite in some beer uh the same beer um in one but not into another keg and um i believe you can even see the color difference uh in those beers and um and I, I, again, think that it's just, it, unfortunately, it's so much easier to get oxygen in on the homebrew level than it is, um, on the, on the big scale. And I think part of that is just like, you know, if I open up the four inch port on our, um, 700 gallon, um, tank, um, that's a smaller opening to 700 gallons of beer than it is. If you open your bucket to your five gallon, you know, that the bucket lid is bigger or the fermenter that you, you uh, the cap that you take off is going to be bigger. And so I just think the, the amount of oxygen per beer, um, is, is kind of, uh, makes homebrewing a little more challenging. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, it would be worth trying it. Um, and you know, you could even just, um, take, you know, I, again, I think it's around 0.2 grams per five gallons. Um, add them to your dry hop bag. Um, and before you dump them in, um, that's, you know, that, that's an easy way to, to do it. It's just dry granules. Um, Great idea. yeah. And we use, uh, or I have used, um, the potassium, uh, metabisulfite. So, um, pretty cheap, pretty easy to do. I don't think it'll have a huge negative impact. And it's one of those things you can do on a couple batches and, and see if, uh, see if you can tell. Thank you so much. 
Yeah. Thanks for the uh, question, Marcelo, and uh, thanks to uh, uh, Scott for the answer. Uh, Joss, you're up. You're next. Go. Cool. Hey. Uh, thank you so much. Actually, there was a lot of great info in there. So uh, really appreciate that. I've got a little notepad here. I've been jotting some stuff down. So definitely looking forward to trying some of these tips out. Uh, one of the ones I actually wanted to uh, expand upon a little bit, and it's something that I haven't played with very much because my my homebrew setup is very manual, which I'm, I'm hoping to switch up in the next few months. But uh, it's the actual, uh, you're talking about whirlpooling. Um, and I was just wondering, uh, and, you and you got into a little bit about the uh, temperature there, and actually a little higher than I thought it would be when you were sort of saying of like the 185 seems to be kind of where certain hops kind of peak out in terms of extraction. Um, but I guess what I wanted to get into was a whirlpool duration or flow rate. Um, how is there anything that uh, you can impart on, on those uh, um, subjects or, 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 or that just the, what you find works best? Um, I mean, I guess uh, obviously to have homebrew scale for most of the people here, but uh, um, even your own process, if you want. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I was always confused about that as well as a, as a homebrewer, because um, you know what, when people started doing a whole bunch of uh, big whirlpool editions, we were kind of copying the bigger, larger breweries. Um, and they were kind of doing it as a, a matter of scale. So, you know, they're adding all these hops, they're, they're spinning, they're getting this going, and then they're letting it settle for 20, um, 30 minutes just to let all that stuff settle out in their um, bigger, bigger kettles. And so I always wondered, um, if we should on the smaller scale be doing what they're doing just because it's, you know, they're doing it because it's practical on the, on, there's so much more beer, so much more volume. Um, as a home brewer though, I, I would, I was always doing like a, a whirlpool edition. So I, I would chill it with an immersion chiller. Um, I was very much, you mentioned you had a you know, pretty scaled down um, homebrew gear. I, I was definitely, that was me. It was just the cooler and the, a couple stove uh, pots and pretty, pretty straightforward, but um, I would use my immersion chiller. Um, I get down to, you know, 190, 180. I would, I would get down a little higher than we do at the brewery just because the, um, the kettle itself with just less volume will drop more than, you know, ours will just naturally during the whirlpool. Um, I would just get it spinning um, manually with a spoon. Um, and it just kind of let it, uh, I would take the, the chiller out so they get a good uh, spin. And then um, I would just let it sit for like 10, 15 minutes. And then I would chill. Um, if you think about how quickly hops um, extract, um, you know, at warmer temperatures, um, especially, I think that there's less concern by just waiting for an hour on your brew day. Um, if anything, I, I would rather just add a little bit more hops and do it for 10, 15 minutes to save myself some time. But that's, that's also just kind of a, um, how I look at it. Um, I'm not too afraid of picking up too much bitterness in, in IPAs from the Whirlpool, especially if you're not doing a bittering charge. Um, and that's where you can really just kind of load up that, that Whirlpool and just do your like 10, 15 minute um, rest and then um, go from there. I, I really just think that you know, those, those warmer temperatures, you, I mean, if you look at some, um, there's some papers where it's like, if they add hops to a kettle that's boiling, it's like a matter of minutes that they're losing a lot of these compounds. Um, and so at a, a slightly less than boiling, I, I would have to imagine it's, it's pretty quick, um, quickly extracted, especially on a smaller scale. So, um, I know there's probably some people that, that, you know, go longer and think that's better. I, I would, um, I, I will say that, um, for beers, like if we really want a beer to be sweet, um, so we'll do some hazy, like we have one hazy IPA where we, it's all hundred percent cashmere. Um, and we have like 5% of a Hefeweizen yeast, um, that we pitch in there with our London ale three. So it's, uh, it's really a unique kind of beer, but we want that to finish sweet. We don't want a lot of bitterness in that beer. Um, so we will uh, whirlpool longer at a cooler temperature for that one. Um, so sometimes we kind of look at bitterness when it comes to how long and, and how, what temperature to, to whirlpool at. But I think as a general rule, it's probably happening. Extraction is happening fairly quickly um, during a whirlpool. So probably no reason to, to waste an hour or anything while they're, uh, while they're steeping. Hopefully that's help, helpful. 
Yeah, no, thank you so much. And uh, definitely keeping an eyeball for when that uh, cosmic punch is available up here in Canada. I've been searching for it already, but uh, I, I think we only got it south of the border so far. So, oh, okay. I that's yeah. <laughs> I it's they actually uh, they, um, I feel like I'm I'm repping them. They just they, they were just at the brewery and I happen to be wearing their shirt today, but you, you should uh, totally ask for a commission. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it's funny. It, it, I it's only two weeks now, yeah. It, it is sort of funny because, uh, like I said, the, the the topic of survivables has come up, and uh, um, Cosmic Punch came up, and uh, there was another one. Uh, I can't remember the name of it now, but I, I remember Cosmic Punch coming up from Omega. And these are the reasons probably why they're not up here yet has to do with the fact that in Canada, I believe uh, these particular uh, strains are considered GMO versus in the U.S. where they're, they're not considered GMO. That's my understanding. Yeah. I, I could be wrong on that, though. So. You, you, I think you are right. Um, they mentioned uh, something when I was talking to them about uh, some other challenges they have going to other countries with the strain. Um, they are very careful to say genetically engineered and not modified when they talk about them. Um, and, and it, you know, I don't want to get like people have a strong opinions when it comes to genetically modified foods and and um, I'm someone who spent a lot of years uh, as a as a lobbyist in Washington DC so I'm very familiar with passionate people on political issues um, <laughs> but when it comes to uh, yeast strains um, you know the cosmic punch strain they're they're taking a gene from chico yeast so it's already a gene that's in yeast that we use all the time they're just turning it on and then you know, over expressing it. Um, I realize that is a little bit, you know, nature might be able to pull that off if you gave it enough time. Um, but you know, it's, you know, it is kind of pushing, pushing the, uh, forcing the, um, the envelope a little bit with the yeast. Um, but to me, it's, um, you know, just my opinion, you're, you're taking genes from an already used yeast strain and, and kind of turning it up. So it's not something that I personally worry too much about. Um, um, I, I'm more excited about the, the potential it has, especially when you start thinking about um, using um, more hops like saws and, and mm. that, you know, not generally use in an IPA, but just because it, you know, the hops themselves are, are, have so much bound potential um, and you're, you're leaving every time you throw away hops, you're throwing away a lot of these precursors. Um, and so if you can really, if we can start to free those, I think that's um, an, an exciting thing and, you know. So they, anyway, they, might, also have, they might, might also have the issue of if they designed this product, uh, they're either looking to patent or copyright it. And that gets more complicated once you start hopping borders to protect. Oh, right. that, and I believe that is the case with, with these strains too. So you're probably right. Yeah. Um, I, oh, I keep seeing data. Uh, <laughs> Daryl and Colin, <laughs> you guys had a, had a question. And Brian, I see you, you have your hand up. So Brian, you'll be next. Um, so, so for one thing I kind of like took away from your book was like, uh, like doing like a bio, my biotrans like addition, if I'm doing that, like warm, as opposed to like my dry hopping that I'm like, you know, doing the soft crash and everything else. Like my concern is that like my biotrans addition, like on my homebrew scale, the hops are sitting in there and they're sitting there warm for like, you know, the entire duration of my fermentation, maybe minus like a day or two. Um, is it something I should be worried about that like I'm having contact time that long at a warmer temperature with those hops that maybe like I'm extracting some like negative compounds from them or yeah. is it like not really something to worry about? That's it's a good question. And I, and I, I can't, that's one that I would love um, some labs or some um, um, people like, you know, shell hammer and those at other uh, great campuses to start looking at a little closer because it is true that there's, there's research that shows the longer you, leave the hops there, especially at warmer temperatures, the more of those you can pick up, like the polyphenols and, and myrcene, for example. Um, however, you're doing it during active fermentation where there's a lot of scrubbing taking place. Um, there's yeast cells in suspension that can be pulling things. Um, and so I think you're probably, those are more of the, those, those more volatile compounds that you can get from um, the longer dry hop additions are, are might be um, being removed because of the active fermentation. Um, 
And so I don't have a great answer in that it's maybe kind of a wash, um, just that, you know, you're removing some from active fermentation. And so like the longer duration maybe isn't having as much of an impact. Um, but I would love to see that, um, love to see that studied because that's something that um, I know, you know, some breweries will do that. They'll, they'll do an active fermentation dry hop um, just to help the hop creep thing happen. Um, you know, so they're, they're, adding the hops warm during active fermentation, giving it a few more days post-fermentation warm just for any sort of hop creep to happen. Um, but what kind of an impact does long-term hopping have? Um, I, I think after, you know, I would be willing to guess after like four or five days of those hops being in there and kind of sitting at the bottom, they're, they're not do, you know, really doing much else anymore at that point. Um, especially with all that active fermentation taking place. But um, man, I would, love to, I would love to see that on paper and see if, if what I just <laughs> said is correct. Um, but that's oh, usually piecing together some of the research. That would be my best guess. That was actually one of my biggest takeaways from your book was like, I love that you almost like challenged people to like, okay, if you guys want to look into this or you want to do this, maybe you should do it. Like you kind of like left it open for people to kind of like take on studies or even home brewers to do things to kind of, challenge like your research or things that you thought were like kind of theories yeah I, i'm glad you you saw it that way because that was i'm very um hesitant to ever say it's the best way to do something because as soon as you say that it gets proven wrong <laughs> uh, and it, it's the book is you know science-based and it's using the research from you know people that are doing their best in a lab to tell to help us try to figure out um why we're getting the results we're getting um and sometimes i find the most interesting parts of studies is not even what they were looking at it's just you know the byproduct of other compounds that they happen to test or um and because they're not actually looking at that but you can still see the results you can kind of theorize certain things that could happen and so um that's kind of where i you know didn't have I was very shy to put like um, actual recipes in because I was afraid people would say okay well the, if it's in the, a book that's science based then this is you know the best way or he thinks this is the best way to do it when it's really like this is one way to put together it um, because even using the science um, the science um, can help you do a, a process tweak with um, different varieties separately so I mean, like I was saying earlier, like Sabro might be a good one to use mid fermentation. Well, if you, you can't say that across the board, um, it just, you know, ev there's just too many variables, which is why a lot of, uh, a lot of this can be um, pretty frustrating. I think too, for, for people, it's just like, all right, just stop. Just like, this is enough information, but um, um, so I've, I've been working a little bit more on, I've got a few more chapters um, in, in the works and written and I'm, interviewing some more um, um, breweries. Um, and I think uh, I'm going to put out a, a, a new one probably in next year um, that will be, um, you know, a lot a, a shorter, but just kind of what's new since the book came out rather than trying to update the old one, just because that's no one wants to has to read through the old one to figure out the, the new updated parts. Um, but I think in that one, if I can convince some, uh, some breweries to um, do do a beer with me and, and at least put the the recipe in there as, as something for someone to try, but more, not really a, this is the best way, science way, but more of a, we, we brewed a, a good tasting beer and um, a, here's something for you to try, but hopefully I can get that done in the next year. And there's um, surprisingly already been a lot of new uh, research since the book was, um, was published. So, uh, which is a good thing. I mean, that the, the more we can kind of learn and um, kind of helps us all and um, it also kind of helps me, uh, the more I focus in on all these studies, it helps, um, helps me stay interested in, in, in beer and not just, you know, start making big batches every day at work. It's more, it keeps that, uh, that uh, experimental part of me uh, alive. So I'm, I'm a big fan of, of uh, every time there's a, a new quarterly uh, release of a bunch of papers to, to dive through them. That was more what like your partner did, right? Like he, like when he wrote American Sour Beer, like he went to all the sour beer producers and was kind of like, we're all doing the same thing, but how are you guys getting to the results that you're getting to? And he kind of like interviewed all the brewers, which was like really interesting. Like almost the same thing with NEPA, right? Like a lot of people do the same thing, but they do it a different way, but get the same result kind of thing, right? Yeah, exactly. And it's always fun to, to hear like I, you know, um, 
go to like the, the book, the first one had, you know, um, other half in there and great notion and these breweries, it's, it's fun to hear how the things they all do or the things they, they sort of separate on. Um, and a lot of it is um, just, you know, their process tweaks are really just a, a matter of practicality because of the equipment they have, for example. Um, and so there's, you know, I, I, the science, and, and Mike is very good at reminding me this, the science can only take you so far. It's really, does it, does the, does the research actually translate into a better beer or, or what you're after? And um, sometimes I think the most helpful things that I've learned is just not from some of these papers, but by exactly what Mike did is talking to, to, uh, to other brewers that are having, you know, tremendous results and um, trying to piggyback on, on that a little bit. But but yeah, that's, that is one of the, the perks too, as I enjoy um, having to uh, leave the brewery for a few days to go interview someone that's making great hoppy beer. Um, it's cool that they're willing to share that stuff with me and, and, and let me, um, you know, print it and write it um, for everyone else to, to hear. I think that's one of the cool things about craft beer is that um, people for the most part are, are pretty open because just because you know my recipe or some other brewery's recipe doesn't mean you can necessarily pull it off. And I think that's um, um, not a cockiness among brewers, but I think it gives them the confidence to share a little more. It's just, you know, it's kind of hard to make really good beer, right? I mean, we all, we all uh, um, do our best, but there's, I feel like every time you, you brew a beer, you get super excited to try it, but then you're always like, the more you drink it, the more you think you can do something better with it. Um, and so even, uh, that's one of the other interesting things of talking to a lot of these other big brewers. Um, they're not done tweaking their beers and changing them just because they have a brand, um, that's established. That doesn't mean they're not still trying to tweak certain things and, you know, get, get a little bit more flavor out of, out of their beer or change the, the water a little bit, or, you know, still messing with whirlpool temperatures or, um, stuff as weird as, you know, um, hopping at high pH can increase the extraction. So what if you make a, a water solution at super high pH, throw your hops in for a little bit, and then add that, uh, the water from that solution into your fermenter, um, at the start of fermentation. And it's just like people get weird ideas and, and, and try it. And, and it's fun when they, when they tell me that, but then, um, they also tell me that they've never done those things on a big batch. So, so they're still, they're still a little conservative, but, um, and Mike and I are definitely like that. We're, um, one of our favorite things is having our homebrew gear at the brewery because you can just, you can just siphon off, um, five or 10 gallons from beer at certain points of the process, tweak something. Um, and then it's, you know, from that point, the wart's already made and, you know, we're comfortable of you know, transferring stuff out of kegs or whatever at this point. So try new hops or try new yeast strains or, um, and then we actually, um, a lot of times when we do these five, 10 gallon experiments, we'll, uh, um, we'll, we'll put them in cans and we'll give them to like our, our club members, which is fun because then we can see what they think of these weird experiments too. And so it's not just us. Um, the beer I, I mentioned, that's the, the all cashmere one with like a 5% hefeweizen yeast. Um, that was just a dumb experiment we did um, and gave it to our club members and they really loved it. And so we were like, well, I guess we should scale this up. Um, so that's still, I think the, the funnest part is when you, you the, the anticip anticipation of a, of a batch, I think is uh, still something I, I have that I remember uh, distinctly having as a home brewer too. Well, no, you found like a your, your, uh, your, your uh, colleagues or co competitors about their secrets because they're all busy uh, focused on hard seltzers, so they'll tell you everything. <laughs> <about here. laughs> have, you, yeah. have you found the big NEPA brewers like willing to like share secrets? Like I know, like it's pretty like we always think like all like the the trilliums and the tree houses are like pretty uh, tight on their like brewing process and everything else. Like they're not very open with sharing things. Like is it just they're more open with you because you're also a pro? Uh -huh. I think, uh, you know, some breweries are still just, you know, there are um, some people just by nature that are, you know, like to hold things closer to their chest. Um, probably people are more afraid to tell me because I, I might write about it. So, um, um, but I'm very, very open with that before. And then they get to see, you know, if anyone's nice enough to let to share with me, I'm going to you know, let them see what's going to be um, um, published. But um, 
I don't know. It's just, you know, there's just no, no, no. some brewers. Um, I think it's more the conversation I get to have with them. It's the, it's the back and forth of what things we've both tried or haven't tried and what we've heard other people are doing that um, in the process of being transparent and describing your pro, um, how you do things um, and having that back and forth, you, you, um, you know, might get ideas to change things or that you're not doing or, you know, it's not so much of transparency from what they're doing, but they can also learn from, you know, the other side of the person on the other side of the table. So um, some breweries are very, very transparent and open. Some are um, a little more uh, close to their chest, but I think um, when it comes down to it, most, most of them are kind of doing the same thing in just slightly different ways. I think there's nothing, um, th there's no magic bullet in a lot of this, you know, there, there's one thing that I do that everyone else doesn't do. That's gonna, you know, uh, make my beer so, so, uh, you know, world-class. I think there's, you know, there's no magic potion you can put in these. And so well, I think for the most part, it's, right now, people right are pretty now. transparent. The, the magic potion's adding whole wheat flour, yeah, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I, I have done that before. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid to admit, but it did. It actually, I, I remember doing a post a while back on adding flour on a beer to make it clear. And it, it did actually um, accomplish that. So I made a clear um, IPA by using, um, I believe it was it oat flour. Uh, I can't remember. I think it was just being a little cheeky, but it, it worked. So like at your brewery, when you're running off, like out of the, like before you do your dry hop, is your beer clear? Cause I've heard that before. Like a lot of these beers, when they're heavily like whirlpool hopped and everything else, before they go to the fermenter, they're actually fairly clear. Um, ours typically are pretty murky at that stage and we're, we're using you know we're still using uh, irish moss um and, and everything like that in, in the kettle um it, it depends on the beer sometimes too like for us like double triple ipas are just so much more grain in there those tend to be they look murky and they look darker than they will in the final beer um, there's just something about that you know the the wartiness of, of the, there's like a warty color that's darker um than fermented beer uh, I, I started to not get, I used to get so hung up on the color of our wort because I was like, why is this so dark? Um, but it like, it, it, it tends to lighten up during fermentation. But um, yeah, I'm trying to think if there's anything we've done or any batches where it was like remarkably clear, um, you know, while transferring. But yeah, you, it, generally it's um, you know, fairly hazy or, or cloudy and, and sometimes just it's kind of messy, like maybe we're getting more of the, the trub or something transferring with it than others. Maybe they get, um, one of the things we do do is, um, I don't like to whirlpool, um, super strong, you know, some breweries will just whip, whip that kettle and just really get a, a strong whirlpool going. Um, I tend to think that, um, the, the harder you, that you're whipping it, the more volatiles you, you probably are. Um, I mean, think about like, why do you pour beer into a glass? You, you shake the glass like this, so those volatiles come out and you can smell it, right? Um, if I'm, you know, it, the wart's warm, it's already gonna volatize uh, quicker. Um, so I like to do, it, it's like more of like a lazy river type whirlpool than something that's really whipping. Um, and so maybe that's potentially why we're not getting as much um, grouping together in the center and have a little bit of a more uh, hazy work. But um, yeah, I'm not entirely sure. Um, I'd be curious to talk to some brewers that are getting a, a clear at that point. Um, usually it does. Uh, I've found that there's certain hop varieties that really can um, like change a beer almost immediately. Um, like Motueka for, it for is one example for us. It just gets super hazy. Um, when we use it. Um, so that would be an interesting one if you do get super clear wort going in and you know, clear after fermentation and using a hop like that. But, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'd love to talk to uh, brewers that actually get um, really clear wort. That's certainly not us. I'm like a big podcast guy. I can't even remember where I heard that from, but I, I remember hearing someone saying like, they were talking about like why hazy beer stays hazy. And like they were saying that when they run off from the kettle into the fermenter, it's perfectly clear i can't remember what brewery it was but it's like yeah, it's probably more of just you know their their um equipment i would i would imagine um i'm not you know entire and and, and 
the uh, grist makes a huge impact too. I mean, if they're, you know, I don't know if they're using a bunch of uh, like oats or malted wheat or spelt. I mean, those things tend to be, uh, make a little bit more of a, 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 a sheen to your wort than, you know, just using a lot of two row and pills, but um, yeah, I'm not sure. It's also probably like the 12th time I've listened to you talk and read your book and I don't actually know what you look like until now. So <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sorry to disappoint you. <laughs> okay. Uh, we're going to move on to uh, Brian Chalk. Uh, Brian, you had a question. So you, you go ahead. And then uh, Michael Cullen, I, I know you got a question as well. So yeah, I was just curious if you uh, tried repitching that cosmic punch at all and if that uh, gene would survive several generations? Um, yeah, it definitely is uh, supposed to. We, I have um, repitched it uh, two or three times, but only going into um, you know smaller batches. So yeah, I, honestly, like what you would probably be doing, I'm assuming you know uh, 10, 15 gallon, five gallon batches. Um, it really is supposed to uh, behave like London Ale 3. Um, so for Omega, it's like the British, British. Uh, I forget what the actual name of the strain is, um, the base strain that is. Um, but yeah, it's through uh, repitches. It should, um, in my understanding, kind of operate the same. So, um, and, and that Cosmic Punch strain too, I would say is, is a little bit more, um, subtle than the Berkeley one. The Berkeley one is actually getting, um, you know, I think like 10 times more of the thio release, which really drives it into like this sweaty fruit, exotic fruit, uh, uh, guava type thing, um, which is a, almost too much for me at this point. It's hard to really know where to work that in. Um, and the other thing with these strains is we found that I think thiols are just um, pretty volatile by nature. And when we um, taste these beers post fermentation. They're super fruity. Cosmic Punch is just like bright, um, white grapefruit juice type of thing. Um, and then heavy dry hopping seems to really um, reduce that fermentation character that we had. Um, so I don't know if 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 the hops themselves, and this is something that the I believe they're um, looking at it in labs, and and actually something that. Um, we did a beer with um, Phantasm powder, the Sauvignon Blanc's um, grape uh, skin stuff, and Cosmic Punch, um, and we um, sent the beer to uh, uh, France um, at three different points in the process to get um, analyzed for thiols, um, because I am um, assuming that dry hopping in some way is pulling out a lot of these thiols, um, whether it's vegetal material or the minerals or the metals. Um, in hops that might be absorbing some of them. Um, so it, it, it's, it's tricky to know the best way to do this, but it, it definitely seems to us like heavy, heavy dry hopping with Cosmic Punch um, can make a great beer, but it seems to uh, reduce the, and maybe it's just masking, but reduce some of that um, fermentation dial characteristic. Cool. Do you know of anyone dosing the enzyme itself, the beta lyase? Um, Maybe after dry hopping or yeah, you know, it's fine. I don't, a lot of people are using, um, beta glucosidase enzymes. Um, Lalamond has one, for example, Scott labs has one. Um, I don't know if there is a beta lyase enzyme that is, um, specifically says that, I mean, that there, there is one from Scott labs. It's called like a, it's either expression aroma or, uh, I think that's the one that mentions right on there that it frees thiols, um, but it just, it's also my understanding that it's not um, beta lyase. So um, I'm not sure if there is one and if there, if someone does know of one that specifically that enzyme, I would love to love to try it. Um, but yeah, I think the, the, in my experience, at least with the beta glucosidase, these um, strains themselves seem to be doing a better job at releasing these styles than the enzymes. And um, I think it's partly because they found that um, the cosmic punch strain, for example, or this is actually, I believe a wine study, um, when they use the genetically engineered strain, um, the release of those style precursors is happening in the yeast cell in the first couple of days of fermentation. 
Um, so that might be why yeast itself that is producing these enzymes um, is, is more efficient at releasing those bound compounds because it's happening directly in the cell and the first couple of days of fermentation where an enzyme, um, you know, you know, is kind of has a, a late start in that regard since it's, you know, just being tossed in. So that might be uh, one potential reason that uh, at least our beta glucosidase is, um, as it relates to beta glucosidase, I haven't had near as an impact using um, some of these enzymes directly than I could tell um, with the uh, engineered strains. Cool. That's really interesting. Awesome. Thanks a lot for the question, Brian. Thanks, Scott, again for for uh, sure. for the answer. Uh, Michael, you have, I think, what will be maybe, unless somebody else comes up, the last question, at least for Scott, and then we can chat. Or if not, if there's more questions, as long as Scott's okay, you know, you can take the questions. But go ahead, Michael. Yeah. So uh, love the book. It changed a lot of my process in doing New England IPA after reading it. So that's fantastic. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for getting it. <laughs> Keep my girlfriend happy because she drinks almost exclusively New England IPA. So that's She's always a smart. good thing. She's a smart woman. <laughs> so I have a question in regards to uh, Quebec yeast and uses in uh, New England IPAs generally, but also more specifically, it its potential impact on um, haze formation. Um, yeah, you know, it's funny. I, I get, um, I'll, I'll get asked every once in a while about um, these strains and it's, um, I don't have a lot of good answers with them. You know, none of the, none of the um, recent papers in the last couple of years that have focused on haze as it relates to hoppy beers. You know, there's a lot of research on haze and, um, a lot of the old research, but that's more of just like which grains are causing haze or, you know, mainly a lot of the research is how do you get rid of haze, the older research. Um, but when it comes to Kavaiak strains, they're just not studied yet, um, at least in, in, in lab situations that I've seen. Um, you know, I, Kavaiak strains, um, you know, when it comes to like hazy, hoppy beers, there's a lot of at least in my mind, um, it seems like the cooler you go, kind of the better. Um, it's just super active fermentation at you know, really hot temperatures is just gonna drive off so many um, hop compounds. Um, and so, you know, it's, um, you know, like for example, there, there's research that, that shows that like dry, um, fermenting cool, like the cooler you go retains more thiols and that's probably just cause it's a less vigorous fermentation. Think of like a lager fermentation where you might retain more um, thiols just because you're, it's, you know, 50 degrees. It's um, a, a, probably a little bit longer of a ferment. Just everything's a little more subtle um, versus just having a strain that just lets it rip at like 90. Um, you're, I, I would assume you're, you're blowing out more of those hot volatiles that you tried to get in from the whirlpool. Um, I'm not sure um, how, um, haze related uh, Kavaik is. I know there is a couple that um, seems to do pretty well um, with haze, um, but I'm honestly just haven't had a lot of experience um, with these strains yet. Um, some of them to me are a little strange in their like ester profile and I haven't found like a great uh, match for them and with um, certain hop varieties. Um, and, and honestly, there's, there's, there's a part of me that's like, we spent so much money on, on ferment, fermentation temperature control at the brewery. I would, I would hate to find out I didn't need it. Um, but these, these uh, Kavaiak strains are, um, um, are great, I think, especially for um, beginning home brewers that don't have, um, you know, the, the fermentation chambers. Um, there's a lot of, um, they're very popular um, overseas. There's a lot of, you know, people in um, Central America and um, places like Brazil too, where the, these strains are huge just because it's already warm there and they, you know, they don't have a lot of, they're, it's not worth having a bunch of these fridges around or, or whatever the case. Um, so I think, that, I think they're great and they have a, a good purpose um, for, especially for home brewers, but um, I would be excited to see more um, research on those in terms of um, what they're doing at, on like a compound level as well as a sensory level. Um, so hopefully that can uh, um, happen soon. 
Great, thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Michael. Thanks for the question. Uh, I can't believe I'm going back to Dana again, which is not really Dana, but Daryl and Colin. So uh, Colin, do you have a question for Scott? Or does Daryl have a question for Scott? Daryl's got a question for Scott. <laughs> <laughs> One of you must have a question, so. Um, my, my question is actually for like sapwood sellers as a whole. Would you guys ever consider maybe doing a bulk order for GTA brews or does it give you too much anxiety shipping over the border with NEPAs and everything else or? Oh, like shipping our beer? Yeah, like if we did a bulk order and because like I've always wanted to try your beer and like now with COVID, it's basically impossible. So, <laughs> you know what we I don't even know if we've had one time we sent beer to another state. Uh, Modern Times uh, had some beer of ours for uh, uh, an event. Um, I mean, I'm always open to the idea. I'm, I'm not sure of, of how uh, how the logistics work, uh, sending beer to another country. Um, that that would, we would have to look at, but uh, you never thought you'd make it this big, eh? <laughs> <laughs> we're actually, we're actually still pretty small. Um, but yeah, I don't know. There, there's a lot of more shipping services too. I don't. Can you guys use any of those? Is it Taver or any of those kind of things? And I might not even be pronouncing that right, but um, there are some um, more companies now that are that are being sort of the the middleman for for shipping beer. But I don't know how that. Um, for here, it's just certain states allow um, beer shipments. So I don't know how that, again, whenever it goes, I, it's hard enough to follow uh, the, the rules in the U.S. I'm not sure how alcohol yeah. in Canada is. It would be tough. I think I only, uh, only from the aspect that even between provinces, which is kind of like between states for you guys, like in yeah. between provinces, it's difficult to ship beer. So um, who knows? I, I would be like, but I would like, that would be awesome. <laughs> that was the case i mean because you hear about it all the time i mean especially during covid i like i like like was daryl was saying I, i'm a uh, i've become a big podcast fan and, and i've been listening and uh you can hear it you can hear from the folks uh like marshall uh marshall shot and those guys and how they were able to now get beers that they were never able to get before and yeah. it's it's suddenly opened their eyes to all sorts of other breweries and uh and it's it's yeah you kind of want that like i mean i would want it it's like geez who wouldn't i think right so i i think it's um uh shipping beer i think is a great thing and, and we might start looking at this actually um in for our mixed fermentation beers um there's just there's less um you know warm temperatures and you know those things just aren't as much of a, a factor with with mix, most of these uh, behind me here are, are mixed firm beers that i steal from the brewery to, to bring back to, to have but um they're sitting warm um, and i think that's a lot of times if you're if you're buying beer that's shipped usually you know the price that's involved in shipping just makes the beer more expensive and i think that lends to more of a you know buying beers that have more of a, a shareable purpose so, you know, buying a bottle that you would take to a friend's or something like that. Um, you know, I, I still get in on the, if the guard is doing shipments, um, if someone's buying some, um, someone is buying beer from, um, you know, Hill Farmstead or um, we're getting stuff from Cantillon, like I'm, I'm getting in on that shipment. So like, I'm still, I still, I still do that kind of stuff. So um, I would love, love to see some of our uh beers be shipped um especially our mixed fermentation beers and also just you know um mike is one of the most knowledgeable guys um i think in that field and i think there's a lot of people that would be um, excited to to try them and so it would be fun to to see those leave the the maryland area i think it'd be awesome i mean i, I don't know about anybody else but I, you know the next i guess the next chance if you don't start shipping, the next chance we would have is probably any of us who decide to go down to home Rucon back in, in, uh, next year, right? Because it's in Pittsburgh and then, oh yeah, you know, there's, there's opportunity, you know, like, I mean, if you want to make an extended trip out of it, et cetera, you know, uh, yeah, well, it might be a lot easier for us to get a bunch of beer to, to Pittsburgh if that was the case. But yeah, yeah true enough. True enough. Uh, Daryl, do you have anything else or? No, I'm good. Huh? 
Anybody else have any questions for Scott before it's now almost 10 p.m. Eastern, so I, I don't want to keep him any longer. Oh, look who it is. Colin, yeah, do you have a question? <laughs> yeah. Colin, okay. Colin, no, he doesn't have a question. Okay, cool. All right. So, um, yeah. Does anybody else have a question for Scott? I mean, uh, I have, uh, number I one, have I, question, I, but I have a comment. Oh, yeah. Go ahead, Michael. Yeah, just to follow up on my earlier question. The reason why I asked that, because I, I haven't done extensive like New England IPAs, but I did one with Arsit and uh, a lot of, you know, citrus hops, and it came out a total citrus bomb, and it was as opaque as anything. <laughs> so that's why I was wondering, like, it's, it comes out more opaque than my other New England IPAs, but it's a Kvike. So I'm wondering if there's something different about that particular strain that, that causes that. Yeah, I mean, there might be, you know, I, every yeast strain, you know, acts differently, you know, certain yeast strains will, will, you know, you start your, you can start your wort with, let's say a, a certain amount of proteins. Um, and then each yeast strain will ferment that wort differently and leave, you know, a, a varying degree of proteins in that beer. And that's just one example. Um, but you know, each strain behaves differently. Um, certain strains will leave like um, hop-derived esters in like 2MIB at higher levels, like S33 and K97 are yeast strains that have been tested that, that will leave more of this kind of apricot thing. Um, and I don't, and there, I don't know why, you know, it's, it's just how they, how they operate. And so, you know, potentially there's something going on with these uh, strains that are, that are really, um, you know, whether it's a protein related thing or a polyphenol related thing, or uh, if it's the elevated heat potentially um, having an impact, um, I'd be curious if you get the same level of haze at, you know, fermenting at 95 um, versus like, you know, 68 with the same strain. I, you know, I don't know what the answer is there, but um, clearly if there, there's probably, you know, something, it sounds like something going on that's, that's making those, um, hazier, but I, you know, I just haven't seen them put to the test. Yeah, I think somebody needs to, to do a whole panel on the Drake's page. <laughs> <laughs> I just do like 15 of them. <laughs> I wish they do. I wish that does happen. That would be great. <laughs> Maybe a suggestion for uh, Marshall shot. Yeah, or uh, <laughs> uh, Lars. Yes, get Lars in there. Yeah. Right? Thanks, Michael. Uh, anybody else have any questions for Scott? I mean, Scott, I, I got to tell you, like, uh, like the last few months, we've had like a number of guests and, and, and including your partner, Michael, right? I mean, and they've all been very, very, very interesting and very uh, uh, informative uh, presentations and discussions. And uh, it's really been like, for myself, I could tell, I could say, because I, I have your book, right? I could say, like, it's been very much a, an honor to have you here and to have you talk about these, about uh, even it, because a number of things. One is like, you're, you, you've said it, listen, hey, I said this in the book, but guess what? I was proven wrong, right? <laughs> you're very, you're, you're very honest and open about that. And that's, that's awesome. You know, at least that's what I think, right? So, um, so I, I don't know, does anybody else have any other uh, uh, comments, questions? If not, uh, I, I don't want to keep Scott any longer. It, it may be past his bedtime if he's brewing tomorrow. <laughs> I don't know, right? So. No, that's that's great. I, I am going to go take off to, to, to eat some food here. I, I raced back to the brewery so I could get here by, by the time. Uh, I'm so glad you sent sent me an email with the uh, Zoom link because I was like, oh, shit, that's right. I got I to gotta get, get home. But, yeah. Uh, I was shocked. I thought, I thought, oh my God, did I send them? A, oh my God, I didn't send them the link. Right? Well, I'm glad you, <laughs> you know? did. Uh, so. It was a good, a good reminder. But, um, and also just thanks for the kind words. And um, it, it's fun to, to do these things. And honestly, sometimes it's, it's uh, fun for me to have to try to talk about stuff I write about because it's, you, you don't always have to verbalize it. And so it, it, it's fun, a good uh, exercise for me um and anytime i can hear you guys say the word about i'm i'm all i'm all about <laughs> <laughs> oh boy 
I don't want to be that guy, but every time one of you guys said it, I was like, there it is. There it is. <laughs> It's so strange for, for you folks in the U.S., right? <laughs> so, thank you. I'm actually from uh, South Dakota originally, so we oh, I, okay. so a bit just, of an accent there already. Yeah, you're just, you're, you, I want to say you're sort of kind of below Winnipeg and yeah. Manitoba. So, <laughs> Scott, thank you very, very much for attending. Uh, Absolutely. We, we really appreciate it, and I think, uh, mm -hmm. I think a lot of us have gained a lot of knowledge off of this. So. Well, I, I appreciate the opportunity and uh, th uh, thanks for having me. And uh, maybe we'll, we'll do it again sometime. All right. Sounds great. Thank right, you. Keep, doing you those, keep doing those podcasts. Thank you. Listen to yeah. them keep doing the podcast. <laughs> right. I'm running out of stuff to say, but I'll try. <laughs> great. Thanks, guys. <laughs> See you guys.